So today we're going to pick up with spinal nerve anatomy. And you can see here in this figure that we have <clears throat> an example of a spinal nerve that's been uh, cross-sectioned and also um, reflected as well. And there's a bunch of items and uh, anatomical features that are present here. Uh, we're going to deal with this initially in a cross-section. So we'll take the cross-sectional anatomy of the nerve. And you should recognize some of this because it looks very similar to what we would see from a skeletal muscle cell. So the cross-section of a nerve is similar to a muscle fiber. <clears throat> so the term nerve refers to a anatomical structure, a single nerve. It's an anatomical structure that is a bundle of many fibers. And these fibers are going to be eventually down to the level of the individual neuron and the axon of those neurons, as you can see in the figure here. The very outside of a nerve, we have a covering, a tough connective tissue. That outer tissue is called the epineurum. And it will encase the whole nerve. Then, as you can see in this figure, just below the epineurium, we have these bundles. <clears throat> you can see four different bundles represented in this picture. Each of those bundles is a fascicle. And these fascicles are going to be smaller bundles of nerve cells or neurons. <clears throat> so you can see that we have several individual fascicles per nerve. Each nerve is going to have several of these smaller bundles. <clears throat> and in this case, there are four that are represented. Now, each of these fascicles, there is also a connective tissue covering, and this is called the perineurium. So these will be surrounded by perineurium. And each of these bundles they contain a mix, or can contain, a mix of both myelinated and unmyelinated fibers. So each bundle won't just necessarily be all myelinated fibers, all axons containing a myelin sheet, but there will be also incorporated within that fascicle, uh, there's going to be individual fibers that are unmyelinated. Now each of these fibers is going to be surrounded by another connected tissue. This is going to be the endonerium. And this will surround each individual fiber. <clears throat> so we have the epineurium on the outside, the perineurium around the fascicle, and then around each individual fiber that eventually will give rise to the axon, as you can see here, it's going to be surrounded by the endonerium. Now, as you can see, packed within the spaces between these fascicles, we actually have blood vessels, blood supply into the nerve.
that. So with that introduction to cross-sectional anatomy, I want to move forward here and talk just a bit more about nerve structures. So you can see here, uh, again, a similar picture, and hopefully you're beginning to recognize things like the gray matter and the white matter, and then you have the roots and the rootlets extending off of the spinal col column, leading towards the posterior ganglion, uh, and then the anterior root into, and posterior root into a full spinal nerve. So the nerve, the spinal nerve, is going to begin here at the uh, exit of the rootlets from the spinal column. So extending from the spinal column or the spinal cord, we will have multiple rootlets. Now these rootlets, again, they're going to come from both the anterior, also referred to as the ventral, and posterior, or also referred to as the dorsal, portions of the spinal cord. Now the collection of multiple rootlets collected together form a root, and we'll have the anterior rootlets forming the anterior root. And the same will go for the posterior. So the posterior rootlets giving rise to the posterior roots, and also that posterior root ganglion, which is that bulge that you can see here on both sides of this structure. From here, all of these roots, from the posterior and from the anterior side, these roots are going to bundle together to form one spinal nerve. The nerves that are produced will run parallel into the body. Now, even though we have the nerves running parallel into the body, depending on where the nerve and where the neurons contained within these roots and rootlets extending into this spinal nerve, where they come from, they all have different functions. The neurons that rise from the posterior are going to be sensory nerves. And they'll bring information back to the spinal cord and the brain. The neurons that arise from the anterior will be motor nerves. And these will bring information and commands back into the body. Now this ganglion here on the posterior root, again the ganglion is the collection of Soma. So we're going to have the neurosoma, the soma of the neurons, present and clumped together here to form that ganglion body. Okay, so let's move on to dictating the location, determining the locations of individual spinal nerves. And I've already alluded to this, but I want to go in just a little bit more detail on how this works. So you can see that the name is based off of the 
uh, cervical vertebrae, thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, or sacral coccygeal vertebrae associated with the spinal nerve. So we have a group of spinal nerves that we can call the cervical nerves. And the cervical nerves, again, these are just simply going to be the spinal nerves that are associated with the cervical vertebrae. And they will be labeled C1 through C8. Now, the, the nomenclature that's used here, C1 through C7, you know that we have vertebrae, C1 through C7. But there's also going to be a C8, and we don't have vertebrae C8. So we got a, a, just a slightly different uh, nomenclature here. For C1 through C7, those spinal nerves emerge superior to the vertebrae itself. It carries the same name. So spinal nerve C1 is going to be the spinal nerve that leaves the spinal column, the spinal cord, from above the C1 vertebrae, above atlas. C8, it's a slightly different nomenclature. This will be the spinal nerve that is inferior to C7. Now, once we get down to the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacral, and coccygeal spinal nerves, they are simply going to be labeled T1 through T12. T1 through T12, L1 through L5, S1 through S5, and CO1. And the way that we are going to determine the name is based off of the emergence of the spinal nerve and the vertebrae that is just superior to the spinal nerve. Or in other words, we will use the inferior, the name of the spinal nerve based off of its position, inferior to the vertebrae of the same name. So this is a vertebral column, and this is T1, T2, T3, and these are my spinal nerves here represented as arrows. This would be T1, this would be T2, this would be T3. This right here would be C8. <clears throat> now as the spinal nerves proceed away from the spinal cord, we get a network of complex branches. So as we move outward, the spinal nerves become more and more branched. And you can see an example of that branching right here in this figure. We're going to have, off of the spinal nerve, a bifurcation leading towards what's known as a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus. So the spinal nerve comes out. This is the vertebrae here. And so we have all the rootlets, everything, the anterior branch and the posterior branch, the ganglion, and the spinal nerve comes out. And then we begin to get more branching. 
together here. It's the posterior ramus and the anterior ramus. We will also have a branch that comes off of these spinal nerves and goes back to the spinal column, and they are going to be called the meningeal branch. And the reason they're called the meningeal branch is because these nerves carried by, or these neurons carried by these meningeal nerves will innervate the meninges. The dura mater, pia mater, and arachnoid mater. The rami, posterior and anterior, will continue on to innervate other organs, including the skin, the muscles, and the organs throughout the body. In this distribution, it's very highly complex, very detailed. Now this branching can continue and we may get a localized spider web like distribution. And many of these spinal nerves will be incorporated into this. And these are known as plexes or plexuses. So again, these plexes are web like groupings, blood like groupings of nerves. And there are a host of nerve plexes. They are going to originate as various spinal nerves. Various uh, spinal nerves will merge. So they're going to merge together based off of where in the body the nerve will be traveling. So to a general location. Now there are several different types of plexes. This is an uh, example of the brachial plexi, and you can see that we have. Uh, the ventral ramus of C5, the ventral ramus of C6, 7, 8, and then T1, they all converge together to form this kind of networked structure. And then as we move deeper in there, you can see that there are more and more named nerves. You will need to be aware of five major flexes. formed formed by our spinal nerves. So this is just an example of one of them, that's the brachial plexes, which you can see that many of these are moving into places like the axillary region. Uh, the median nerve is uh, arriving here from the brachial plexus, which is going to be a nerve that is found in the forearm. In addition to the brachial plexus, we have the cervical, cervical plexus, the brachial, the lumbar, the sacral, and then the coccygeal. So at this point, um, what I'd like to finish up here with 
excuse me, is the, uh, the spinal nerves is dealing with what are known as somatic reflexes. Somatic reflexes. Somatic means body, and a reflex is going to be a quick, involuntary, but expected reaction to a stimuli. So a quick, involuntary, but expected reaction to a stimuli. Typically, when we are dealing with somatic reflexes, and really reflexes in general, uh, we refer to them in a reflex arc. And you can actually trace through an arc-like structure, as you can see illustrated in both of these figures here. Now, the reflex arc, or the somatic reflexes, are going to be due to the function due to the function of several nervous system components. So several components will come together to facilitate a somatic reflex. We are going to have receptors that will pick up information about the internal or external environment about the individual's surroundings. Those receptors are interfaced with a neuron that will carry information about that stimuli. This will move along a spinal nerve through the spinal column and then will relay information back out to an effector. So receptors pick up the information, neurons carry information, and effectors help to dictate the response or to carry out the response to the stimuli. Okay, now again, we typically describe these complex reflex reactions or reflex physiology in a reflex arc. So in that reflex arc, we're going to have some sort of somatic receptor. So we'll have some sort of receptor that is out in the body, and we may find these somatic receptors in the skin, in muscles or tendons, just to name a few examples. These somatic receptors are going to be innervated by an afferent nerve. And that afferent nerve is going to be the nerve that carries the signal, the information picked up out here by the somatic receptor carries it back into the spinal cord. And in particular, it's going to carry this information to the posterior horn or the brain stem. Now, hopefully you'll remember that the posterior horn is that part of the spinal column that is made up of gray matter. And so this is typically non-myelinated uh, non-myelinated tissue, and that's why it's got that gray appearance. But it acts as an integrating center. So this integrating center, this is the information that's carried into this gray matter. information is going to be processed and then we are going to send out a response. We're going to repair a response to send out. We're going to integrate the information. 
It is going to be an efferent, an efferent nerve that is going to carry that signal, that information that's just been generated on how to dictate to the stimuli out to the muscle or some other reactionary tissue, which is going to be the effector. So we carry the signal through an efferent neuron out to the effectors, and it's going to be the effectors, typically a muscle, but it could be a gland or some other organ, that muscle that will carry out the predetermined expected response. Now, you can see here that we have our sensory receptor and we've got a little Bunsen burner here with a flame. And so you can pick up and detect that noxious signal of burning your hand. This is our afferent neuron that leads into the integrating center. Here we have what's called an integrating neuron. This is the portion of the nervous system where that information is going to be picked up and it's going to dictate what needs to happen. The dictation of, okay, this part of the body is being burned is determined and the right nerve here in red acts as the efferent to send information out to the correct muscle that will say you need to contract to pull the hand away from this noxious signal. Now there is an additional organ that is going to help out in this response process and those are called these are called muscle spindles. And these muscle spindles are going to aid in the process. So what you can see here, this is a whole muscle. And then within that muscle, we have these specialized uh, non-contractile fibers. They're called intrafusal fibers, whereas the muscle fibers that contract are going to be called extrafusal or ordinary muscle fibers. So these do not generate any sort of force, but they are innervated by what's called a gamma motor neuron, uh, as opposed to an alpha motor neuron that we would find out here in the extrafusal or ordinary muscle fibers. Now, these do not contract to produce any force, but they do respond and change their length based off of how the extrafusal fibers are contracting. So we're going to find these muscle spindles, these specialized muscle cells and the connecting nerve fibers. We're going to find them embedded in the muscle. And really what these muscle spindles help to do is to sense the muscle's position and is able to develop a signal that can, that can dictate those positional terms or characteristics for this particular muscle. So this information that's generated by the muscle spindle based off of the positional characteristics, tension characteristics of the muscle feedback through these sensory nerves to the central nervous system. These muscle spindles are typically going to be found near a tendon. typically near tendons, uh, and they vary in concentration. For muscles that are fine motor control muscles, we need to have a continuous, very high resolution picture of uh, muscle position. These fine motor control muscles will have an increased concentration of muscle spindles, whereas muscles that are a more coarse motor control muscle we are going to have a lower concentration of muscle spindles so this information will also feed back into the central nervous system so if you're burning your hand 
it will help to determine that the muscle is moving or has moved uh, and, and will help to effectively respond to or react to any sort of ex external or internal environmental changes. So I want to circle back now and take a look at an individual reflex. Take a look at some individual reflexes. Uh, and really, I guess we're going to only look at one. But there are many different reflexes that we could look at. But we are, again, going to just examine one of those reflexes. The particular reflex that we are going to examine is known as the stretch reflex. The stretch reflex. Uh, and that's the picture that you see here. And you can see that we have our, uh, our muscle spindle with our sensory nerve and our motor nerves connected up. And then uh, the information um, for the sensory and motor neurons for the whole muscle. The stretch reflex, and there are several different types of stretch reflex. These are going to be also called myotatic reflexes. These remain very important reflexes for balance. If we were to lose the myotatic reflex, we would impair balance. Your muscles are in a constant state of controlling position. And because of the myotatic reflex, we can, the muscle can fight back and maintain posture and balance, even in the event of a sudden change. Now, I've already said that there are several different types of myotatic reflexes or stretch reflexes. The most familiar is one that you have all seen before. And it's going to be the knee jerk reflex. Okay, so the knee jerk reflex. And that's what's being exhibited here. You can see that we have a hammer tap that's going to occur. So we use a knee reflex hammer or mallet to tap the patellar tendon. Now this is a sharp blunt force and what this actually shows or exhibits in the human body is that the patellar tendon, during that quick instantaneous uh, tap with the patellar tendon hammer, the knee reflex hammer, is that that tendon is instantaneously stretching. Now this instantaneous stretch, if it's allowed to continue, it would indicate that the muscle could be torn or the tendon itself could be torn as it gets stretched out. And so the body interprets that as a need to revert or uh, counter the stretch. So when we tap on the patellar tendon with the reflex hammer, the muscle spindles, the muscle spindles in the quadriceps femoris, I'm just going to abbreviate that as quad femor, so quadriceps femoris are stretched. Now remember, these are those um, non-force producing muscle fibers, so they just are going to stretch out. And as they are stretched, information is fed back through those sensory nerves. So we have a primary afferent 
nerve that will carry the signal generated by the stretching patellar tendon to the spinal cord. So the afferent signal feeds back onto the spinal cord. And it says the tendon is stretching, the patellar tendon is stretching at a astronomic rate. In response, an alpha motor neuron or alpha motor neurons will be stimulated in the spinal cord. And so these are going to be efferent neurons. They're going to take information, a signal back out towards the organ, towards the muscle. There's going to be two that are involved. One that travels to the quadricep femoris muscle, and then the other that travels to the hamstring. By the way, this is all occurring uh, through the use of action potentials. We're going to have a, a, a stimulatory signal that will travel to the quadricep. And that stimulatory signal, <clears throat> alpha motor neuron, release of acetylcholine, uh, the nicotinic receptor, the acetylcholine receptor, you're going to have influx of uh, calcium into the cell, causing the muscle to contract. Now, the reason that this is important is because that contraction, remember, the body believes that the patellar tendon is stretching. And by contracting and pulling on the patellar tendon, we're covering the stretch. At the same time that the uh, stimulatory signal is being produced, we're also going to have an inhibitory signal. And that inhibitory signal is going to be sent to the hamstring. So that inhibitory signal is sent to the hamstring. This is going to allow the hamstring to remain relaxed so it doesn't counter the contraction of the contracting quadricep. The result of both of these motor outputs is for the foot to jerk out. And the knee is extended. So that's just one example of a stretch reflex or a myotetic reflex. Now notice that in this figure we have a green nerve that interfaces or innervates directly with a purple nerve. And so there's just two individual neurons here and a single synapse. So for the knee jerk reflex we only have one synapse between the afferent and efferent nerves or neurons. We could also have an interneuron, so a intervening neuron that would create a afferent and a synapse with the inner neuron, and then a synapse between the inner neuron and the efferent neuron. So this, with just a single synapse, we call that a monosynaptic reflex arc. In the case of the afferent, inner, and efferent neurons, where we have more than one synapse, we would have a polysynaptic reflex arc.
so we would have the intervening neuron.